Good evening. How are you tonight? Good to see you. Happy Sabbath. And the Sabbath is beginning in just a few, well, an hour or so. And uh, sunset Friday to Saturday sunset is the Sabbath. And so we're excited that we can start this Sabbath time together with you with another meeting of Unlock Revelation. And uh, I have a few announcements for you. Uh, as always, please turn off your phone or put it on silent so that we can concentrate. The best thing is to turn it off so you're not tempted to do anything else. Also, I want to remind you that tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we're going to have our next meeting. Pastor West will be presenting on one of the most demanded topics when it comes to the book of Revelation. People always ask, what is the mark of the beast? What is the mark of the beast? And Pastor West is going to reveal that tomorrow in our presentation at 11 o'clock here for church service. I also want to remind you that you can sign up for our Phase 2, Unlock Revelation Phase 2 meetings outside at the registration table. After these meetings are over, we're going to have uh, an opportunity for you to come on Wednesdays and, Friday, uh, Wednesdays and Saturdays uh, for a special um, personal Bible studies um, connected to the book of Revelation. So we're excited to have that as well. And also I want to encourage you, for those of you who have not maybe turned them in yet, you can turn in your study guides. It's not too late to do that at the It Is Written Bible School outside with Cindy. And you, even if you haven't turned any in yet, you can start now or you can still do all the ones that you have already been done and turn them in to still receive your prize at the end of the meetings. All right. With this said, I want to invite Pastor West to join us on stage for our drawing and our Bible question. All right. Good evening, everyone. Is that better? There we go. All right. How's everyone tonight? And once again, I, as I heard Jonathan mention, it is almost time for the Sabbath. Amen? A sacred time, a precious time, a holy time that God invites us to come aside from the world and just to plug into Him and draw close to Him. So how many of you are thankful for those Sabbath hours Amen. that are coming upon us? Amen? What a blessing it is. All right. Well, let's do our drawing tonight. And we have a couple of gifts. I'm going to give away another one of these beautiful, great controversy books that uh, you should get one. If you weren't here on Wednesday night, be sure to pick up a paperback copy. I'm giving this book away. It's one of the best books on prophecy that I've ever read. And it's very comprehensive. It goes from the time of Jesus all the way to his second coming. And so it passes through our time today and then talks about the prophecies of the future. And then we're going to give away, I'm going to give away two items as one, a Prophecy Foundations DVD and also a Bible Answers, Book of Bible Answers from Amazing Facts on some very difficult passages that a lot of times people get confused about. So let's see who our winners are tonight. James Bushry, James. Uh, all right, would you like, which one would you like? It's the same one, but this one is bigger and it has pictures and it's just a real nice version of it. So you can have either one. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure which one you had. You can take both of those. That's for your computer. It's not to watch. It's for the computer. You already got one? Okay, well, I'll give you something else with that. All right. Okay, so the winner of... Michelle Stewart, you can, I'll give you a choice. All right. The DVD? All right. She'll take the DVD. Give them a hand tonight. I'll, that saves me another gift I'll give away tomorrow night. All right. How about our Bible question tonight? All right. Our Bible question tonight uh, says, regarding the subject of unclean foods, what about the passages in Mark 7 and Matthew 15 where Jesus said all foods are purified? That's a right. very good question. How many of you were wondering about this verse? And uh, it's a very specific verse. And people point to this verse a lot. And they say, well, what about this? So remember, we always have to take every passage in context. All right? In context. So let's take a look. First, we'll go to Matthew chapter, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 7. And then we're going to jump over to, uh, to Matthew chapter 15. All right, now, let's go 
to Mark chapter 7, and we're going to answer this. I, I knew someone would ask this. Someone always does. And we're going to, I'm going to jump right to the verse that says this, and it's going to appear like I have spoken you an ill truth by talking about unclean foods. But as you'll find, when we unpack the passage, it's going to make perfect sense. So Mark chapter 7 and verse... Um, Verse 18, so he said to them, are you us without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, but it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? And he said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. So somebody would say, well, Pastor West, that seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Well, friends, once again, we have to take all the verses together and see what they say. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Let's go now over to um, verse, if you go back to verse, let's see here. Go back to verse 1. Go back to verse 1 of chapter 7, okay? Sense when we look at it all together. Chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. <clears throat> now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with what? Unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash and there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. And then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but break bread with unwashed hands? Then Jesus said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of what? Men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers, cups, and many other such things as you do. And he said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Then he gives the example of them saying, basically, that they should honor their father and their mother, while using, using the offering to God to take care of their parents. So he goes through that, and then he goes on down, and he begins to say what, he, he, what I just read to you. So does that make sense so far? Okay. Now, Mark 7 leaves out a very important piece that Matthew chapter 15 actually brings into play. Okay. So go with me over to Matthew chapter 15, and we're going to find this uh, find the, the bottom line of the point. So, look in chapter 15 and verse 1, and it says, Then the scribes and the Pharisees, who were from Jerusalem, came to Jesus, saying, It's the same story. Okay, same story. Why do disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? And so, the point that Jesus makes, or, or the, actually the point that the elders or the Pharisees are making, they say, why do your disciples transgress the commandment of who? Of, of man, right? And Jesus returned the question to them saying, why do you transgress the commandment of God? Okay, so which point is more important? The, 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 the laws that man had created or the laws that God had created? that God had created, okay? Now, go back over, <clears throat> same chapter, go down to verse 10. He repeats himself what we just read in, in Mark 7. He says, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, that defiles a man. And then he goes on and, 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 and the Pharisees get offended and Jesus said, leave them alone. And look at verse 15. Here's the, here's the point that is the bottom line. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, 
Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, and blasphemies. But look at verse 20. This is the key. These are the things which defile a man. But notice this. But to eat with what? Unwashed hands does not defile a man. So in the context of Jesus saying all foods are purified, what foods was he talking about? Huh? He was talking about clean foods and he was dealing, the subject that he was dealing with was not the commandment for clean and unclean. What if Jesus had said to the Jews of all people, the Jewish Pharisees, it's okay to eat pork. It's okay to eat unclean foods. What do you think that would have done? If they, were, if they were on his case about breaking the commandment of the elders to eat with unwashed hands, what do you think they would have said if Jesus had said, go ahead and eat anything you want? They'd have stoned him right there. They'd have went crazy on him, right? And so the subject that Jesus is referring to here in both passages, it's not the subject of clean and unclean foods. It's dealing with the traditions of men in eating with washed or unwashed hands. Does that make sense? And what Jesus is saying is, it doesn't matter if you wash your hands according to the traditions of the elders when you eat food because it's not going to make it clean or unclean. Well, the most important thing is what comes out of your heart. But Jesus is not referring here to clean and unclean foods. It's dealing with the traditions of the elders that were not the commandments of God. Amen? Now, the issue of clean and unclean foods, is that a commandment of men or a commandment from God? It's from God, amen? Does that make sense tonight? If it doesn't make sense to you, come and talk to me. I see a lot of heads going like this, and we'll try to clarify that just a little bit more. All right, good question. Thank you for asking it. All right, our upcoming schedule, real quickly, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., the mark of the beast. Friends, you don't want to miss this. We have actually been building up to this for weeks now, and you don't want to miss it. I know it's Saturday morning, but if we're following God's commandment, we are not going to be working anyway, right? We're going to be resting and worshiping. So come on out tomorrow for worship, and we'll study that subject, the mark of the beast. Then tomorrow evening, 6.45, we do have a special lunch prepared for you if you'd like to stay for that tomorrow. Then tomorrow evening, Revelations 4 Horsemen, of the apocalypse. We're going to study Revelation chapter 6 tomorrow night, dealing with the seven seals of Revelation. Then again, Sunday night we're off as usual. Monday night and Wednesday night, Revelation's End Time Movement Part 1 and 2. Friends, these two meetings are going to tie everything from the seminar together, and it's going to be some of the final pieces in that puzzle you're not going to want to miss. Monday and Wednesday night, I plead with you, friends, and I warn you ahead of time, Satan will try to keep you from being here, but don't let him. Come, amen? Come and don't let him keep you, but just, just do whatever you have to do to be here. It's so important, and you'll see why on that night. So that's our upcoming schedule. Next week is the last full week of the series. The next week after that is just a, just a few nights that week. And then we're going to enter into phase two of our meeting. So I want to encourage you to sign up for that. It'll be real short. Wednesday nights at 7, Saturday mornings at 9.30, and just twice a week, once on the Sabbath. So it'll be really one night a week. And I want to encourage you. We have some beautiful lessons that basically go through every chapter of Revelation. And we'll be doing those studies together. So I want to encourage you. It'll be in a smaller group setting. It won't be quite as formal. But we'll just come in, we'll study together, and then you'll be out the door Quick, so I want to encourage you to do that. All right, tonight our special music is once again by my good friend Jeremy, and he has such a special talent. I'm so thankful for him to come and sing for us this evening. Have you been blessed so far by the music each night? Yes? All right, thank you so much, Jeremy. <laughs> Spinning 
round and round Wrap up all the shattered dreams of your life And at the feet of Jesus lay them down Give them all, give them all Give them all to Jesus Shattered dreams, wounded hearts And broken toys Give them all, give them all Give them all to Jesus And He will turn your sorrows into joy He never said you'd only see sunshine And He never said there'd be no rain He only promised a heart full of singing about the very things that once brought pain Give them all, give them all Give them all to Jesus Shattered dreams, wounded hearts And broken toys Give them all, give them all Give them all to Jesus And He will turn your sorrows into joy Shattered dreams, wounded hearts, and broken toys Give them all, give them all Give them all to Jesus And He will turn your sorrows Yes, He will turn your sorrows He will turn your sorrows into joy quite like it in the world. Amen? How do you just experience that grace of God each day and it just transforms our hearts and it draws us more sweetly to Him. Amen? Well, our subject this evening is Revelation's Scarlet Harlot. Revelation chapter 17 is the basis of our study this evening. A very serious subject, a very solemn subject, a subject that's very important. And Satan never ceases to try to cause us to be distracted and to be drawn away from the truth, which is Jesus. And so tonight, we want to ask a very special prayer as we begin our study this evening. I'll just kneel to and invite you to bow your heads with me. Father, tonight, Lord, we just lift ourselves up to you. Lord, you know I, I haven't felt well. Lord, you know that um, things are going on with my health. Nothing serious or life-threatening, Lord, but just Satan is always attacking and putting thorn in the flesh. But I pray tonight that the Spirit of God would come, speak to our hearts. He would bring power. He would bring truth. He would open our eyes to what you want us to see, O oh Lord. And we pray tonight, Lord, that nothing would hinder us from knowing, believing, and accepting the truth. So we ask your blessing now, and we pray that you'll come. In Jesus' name, amen. 
we studied last night, or not last night, but Wednesday night, this beast power from Revelation chapter 13, the second beast power, and we saw that it was none other than the United States of America. How many of you remember studying that the other night? And so question number one, we're just going to dive right into our study guide tonight. It says, as review, what are some of the characteristics that reveal the second beast power of Revelation chapter 13? Verse 11 told us, told us, Then I saw another beast coming up from the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And we found a number of identifying points from this verse that tell us exactly who this power is. And this power in the last days would tell those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And we asked the question, who is this second beast of Revelation chapter 13? <clears throat> well, we looked at several identifying points, seven to be exact, of this power, and we saw who it was. So we're just going to quickly review those. Point number one was that it would arise around 1798, because in Revelation 13.10, John says, I saw that beast, first beast go into captivity, and then I saw the second beast rising up into power. And we know that that first beast, Roman, the Roman church, went into captivity around what year? Or in what year? 1798. The second point is that it would arise in an unpopulated area away from populated Europe. We found that in verse 11 because it rose up from the earth. Thirdly, it was a new nation not built from the former European nations. Fourthly, it would rise up rapidly into power out of nowhere. Fifthly, it would be a new type of government without a king, verse 11. It would originally be established on Christian principles, but would over time abandon these to speak as a what? As a dragon, the Bible said. And then seven, it would ultimately emerge to worldwide influence and power because it would cause the whole world, the Bible says, to worship the first what? The first beast. And we, as we looked at all seven of those characteristics from the Bible, if you weren't here, friends, it's, we're just doing a very quick review. I encourage you to get the study guide and the CD. But as we looked at all of these points, we saw that the second beast power could be none other than which entity? The United States of America. How many of you saw that clearly from the Bible, clearly from history, clearly from current events? You remember seeing that on Wednesday night. Make no mistake, friends, our beloved nation, the United States, is certainly mentioned in Bible prophecy of the last days. <clears throat> so question number two says, how does prophecy reveal or say that the United States will unite the world to give loyalty and submission to the Roman church? The answer is in Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. <clears throat> the Bible says, and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the Bible says that these two powers, the Roman Church, the United States, will collaborate to cause the whole world to worship that first beast power. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 13 that all the world would worship except those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How many of you want your names written in the Lamb's Book of Life tonight? by the pen of Jesus this evening. Amen. Well, the Bible tells us that in the future, church and state will unite to enforce false worship in the world that goes against the law of God. And remember, friends, from way back when, several weeks ago, we studied that the law of God is not just about rules and, and, and things that we have to do, but it's a revelation of whose character? It's a revelation of God's character. Amen. And so when it reveals his character, it reveals from his heart. Amen? It reveals the principles that he lives by. And so the Bible tells us that these powers will force the world to worship contrary even to the character of God. These two entities coming together. Have we already seen that movement taking place, yes or no? We are already seeing it today very pointedly, very specifically. And we're going to look at some crystal clear evidence tonight. Thomas P. Milotti, U.S. Ambassador to the Vatican at one point, says, I believe that the United States, as the world's only superpower and the Holy See, as the only worldwide political sovereignty, have significant roles to play in the future. Their actions will impact the lives of people in all parts 
of the globe. Can you imagine, friends? You remember we said that, uh, I showed you this from World News 2009, Pope Benedict made the mention, there is an urgent need of a true worldwide political authority. Such an authority would have to regulate the law and would need to be globally recognized. It would have to have the authority to enforce submission from all nations in its decisions. And so already the promotion of a world power. In fact, friends, I didn't put this in, I'll put this in a future one, but the, the Prime Minister of Israel, one of the former Prime Ministers, spoke about the, that the fact that the UN is outdated. And he said, we need a, a religious UN that unites all the nations, all the nations and all the religions together. And he actually made a suggestion, this was in World News, that Pope Francis be the one that leads that world political unity of religions. That was just last year that that happened. I'll put that slide and I'll show it to you in one of our upcoming uh, messages. Very, very interesting. On October 24, 2011, Pope Benedict again called for a global authority with universal jurisdiction where each of the world's nations would transfer some of their power to a central authority that would ensure justice to the world. So the stage is being set, friends, for this world power, this new world order to be in place where the papacy in the United States lead the world and cause them all to bring this worship. Remember I showed you this picture the other night. This was at the 2012 um, presidential Republican and Democratic National Conventions and that Cardinal Timothy Dolan, who's the top uh, cardinal for the Roman Church in America, actually held the closing prayer for both parties in that convention, in those conventions. Can you just imagine that, friends? So once again, let me just make this clear. I, I, I will do this every night I speak on these subjects, asking you tonight, are we speaking and criticizing good, godly Roman Catholic Christians who love the Lord Jesus, who give their hearts to him, but are unfamiliar with these truths? Are we talking negatively about those people, yes or no? Not at all, friends, but the Bible simply exposes a system. Jesus says he has his people in how many churches? Every church and he's drawing their hearts to him. So let me make sure that we understand that tonight. But the Bible said that all the world would wander after the beast, and are we finding that to be true in 2016, yes or no? Now, friends, certainly more than ever. And we find that in the future, the final issue of loyalty will center around worship. Who are we going to worship? Who are we going to give our allegiance to? Who are we going to give our loyalty to? Who are we going to give our hearts to tonight? How many of you want to give your hearts to Jesus tonight? And we want him to be the center of our lives. And so we will find ourselves as time draws to a close and Jesus prepares to come to, the world, to this world, we'll find ourselves in the, on one of two sides. There will be a dividing line that will divide the world and we will either worship the beast or we will worship the true Christ. Jesus Christ or the Antichrist, how many of you want to find yourselves worshiping Jesus Christ tonight? We want to give our hearts to him. Friends, when we give our hearts to him, we follow him in obedience. And he says, if you love me, keep my what? Keep my commandments. And Jesus never said it would be easy. Jesus never said it would be convenient. Jesus never said it would be popular. Jesus said, if man, any man would follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. But Jesus calls us because the peace that Jesus gives to us when we follow him is greater than any peace we can find in the popularity or the convenience of this world and this life. How many of you agree with that tonight? We want to follow Jesus this evening. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints in the midst of that chaos. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. How many of you want to be the saints tonight of Jesus, keeping his commandments? Number three, how will this worship contrary to God's law be enforced? The Bible says he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who is wounded by the sword and lived. The question tonight is, what is that image that is created? What is that image? An image is something that is a likeness of or a symbol or a representation of something else. So if the devil wanted to unite people religiously, 
what vehicle might he use? And the question is, what vehicle did he use in early Christianity? You know, when the church, when the church first started out, as we're going to study tomorrow night, the church was very pure, and the devil persecuted the church. There were Christians who were burned at the stake, there were Christians who were thrown to lions, and the devil found that the more Christians he killed, the more people became Christians. And one of the ancient philosophers of old said that when you kill Christians, their blood is seed. People would see the peace and the joy and the happiness on the faces of the Christians as they were put to death because they knew their eternity could be, was secured with Jesus. They were trusting in the promise that Jesus gave. Don't fear the man who can kill your body but cannot kill the soul, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. They trusted in the living Christ, amen? And they feared not what man could do to them. And so Satan realized that he was not making any progress by trying to kill off all the Christians. And so as the old saying goes, if you can't beat them, do what? Join them. And so Satan became baptized in the Christian church. Well, not exactly, but notice what happened in history. This is what happened. From the book, The Two Babylons, by Dr. Alexander Hislop, a book on Christian history, he said to conciliate or to bring in the pagans to nominal Christianity, Rome, pursuing its usual policy, took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals, what? Amalgamated. What does that mean in, in Laban's terms? It means this, that Satan realized that his better avenue was not opposing Christianity, but trying to simply water it down. How do you know something about that in today's world? Those of you that have been alive for several decades, has the Christian church over the last several decades or even centuries begun to be watered down? What do you think? Instead of preaching about repentance for sin, we preach about the the promise of prosperity while committing sin. Instead of rejecting sin, God embraces sin. Now, God embraces the sinner, amen? And he does love the sinner, but he calls the sinner, when they come into fellowship with him, to forsake their sin because no man can serve two masters, amen? And God calls us to serve him and to become slaves of righteousness and not slaves to sin, amen? But Satan has watered that down, saying that God will prosper us when we go blatantly against his law. And the scripture says, no way. Amen? And so Satan has attempted throughout history to amalgamate or blend together Christianity with unbiblical teachings and practices of paganism, spiritualism, and all kinds of other stuff. So how exactly has he done it? He continues and says, and to get paganism and Christianity, which was at that point in time now far sunk in idolatry, in this as in so many other things, to do what? Shake hands. Hey, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. So how has this happened? I'm going to give you several examples tonight of how this has happened down through the ages. Okay? So you remember <clears throat> the Roman Catechism, which talks about uh, reveals the Ten Commandments. And you remember we talked about several weeks ago that the second commandment to not have graven images was what? It was removed, and the tenth was split in half, and like an Excel spreadsheet, they were all bumped up. So the third commandment became the second, the fourth, the third, and so on, right? And so the reason, there's a reason why this commandment was removed from the Roman Catholic version of the Ten Commandments. And do you know why? Once again, I'm not criticizing, just, just revealing. Just revealing. Because in the Roman Church, there are many what? Icons and idols and statues that are symbolized by various people. Jo um, um, what was Mary's husband? Joseph, Mary, uh, the, the apostles. Now, friends, this is very interesting because... This is the statue of St. Peter in St. Peter's Basilica in, in the Vatican in Rome. Okay? Now, this statue is supposedly of Peter, 
But if you look at the top of it, notice what's there. Let me show you a different picture. Notice what's up there. Do you know what that is? It's a sun disk. And if you look at the face, if you look at the picture, the, 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 the type of art that that is, what does that look like to you, the pictures you've always seen? A Roman what? A Roman, one of the Roman or Greek gods, right? And so what actually has happened is, very simply, that, and this is true, this is true, that when the, um, many ancient years ago, when they had these statues of these Roman and Greek gods in the pagan temples, this statue was actually removed from a pagan temple, taken to Rome, inserted, and renamed St. Peter, when it was formerly Zeus. Now, what's inter also interesting, it, it also, as I mentioned, you notice the sun disk above the head, which is a symbol of the sun god being worshipped. But here's a picture of the foot, and it looks kind of melted. Do you know why it's melted? It's actually because of centuries of uh, blessed, dear, innocent Roman Catholics who came to St. Peter's Basilica, and they actually were, would come up and kiss the feet of Peter. And when they would kiss the feet of Peter, it was believed that you would receive some kind of indulgence and so many years would be taken off of your time in purgatory. So people would make pilgrimages to come and kiss the feet of the statue of Peter, which was actually formerly in a pagan temple under Zeus. And so, friends, this is a very dangerous uh, thing that has happened that we're now bowing down and kissing the feet of idols. Also, the concept of Maryism in the Roman Church. Uh, as Roman Catholics were converting, bringing uh, pagan, uh, the pagan people into the church, the pagans were used to worshiping multiple gods, and they were used to worshiping male and female gods. And um, there's nothing against females, but that's just what they were used to. And so they were, they were finding it problematic when they came into the church that you had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but no female God. And so the concept of Mary was actually elevated to make the pagan people coming into the church much more comfortable. And now they would have a female entity which they could give reverence, devotion, and essentially worship to. And Mary actually was elevated to the place of intercessor between God and, and man. And so now, I, instead of praying directly to Jesus, like the book of Hebrews says, Jesus is our high priest that intercedes before God's throne for us. Now I pray to a saint who will pray to Mary, who will pray to Jesus, who will pray to God. And when God gives the answer, he gives it to Jesus, who gives it to Mary, who gives it to the saint, who gives it to me. And friends, there's this whole host of things that I'm having to go through in order to get a connection with God. How many of you think we ought to just be able to go straight to God through Jesus Christ? Amen? That's what I believe tonight. So here is a number of pictures of the saints uh, and the Pope giving, or, and the cardinals giving reverence and homage to Mary. Now I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. In many of these statues, you see this one here, and also this one, and I think I have another one. There's another one right there. Pope Francis burning incense to Mary. If you notice in all three of these pictures, is Jesus included there? He actually, he is. But what is he in the form of? See, there's his crown. He's in the form of a baby. And <clears throat> what does that do to the importance of Jesus when it's compared to Mary? It actually does what? It actually reduces his importance in the role of redemption. And that Mary is really the one that intercedes. And Mary is called the Queen of Heaven by the Roman Church. And in fact, there's a, there's a Bible verse that talks about the Queen of Heaven, but it's not referring to Mary. It's actually referring to false gods and false uh, worship. All right. Then in the pagan... Um, uh, pagan worship and the rituals, there was often a staff that would have a pine cone at the end. And there, uh, as you see, this is a picture of a pagan, uh, pagan symbol. What are those right there? They're serpents, and they are surrounding and they are enamored by this pine cone 
which is actually a symbol of fertility and false worship and, and those kind of things. And if you notice in the church, here's the staff with the crucifix of Jesus, but notice what's right there on the, uh, right there. It's a what? It's a pine cone. There's another one right there, picture of a pine cone. Um, and so you have this pine cone using pagan practices, which was honored and reverenced as, uh, as a fertility and blessing, now being used in the Roman church as well. Isn't that very interesting, friends? These things brought from ancient paganism brought into now Christianity through the church. Well, what about the Seventh-day Sabbath as well? Um, that the day was changed to give honor to the sun, and people were worshiping the sun. The pagans were worshiping the sun god on Sunday. They were having holy fest not holy festivals, but they were having basically fun festivals, and they were eating and drinking and being merry as they worshiped the sun. And when they began to come into the church, they found the Sabbath to be too restrictive. But as we've studied the Sabbath, as we've seen what Jesus actually intended it to be, is it to be restrictive at all, yes or no? Not at all, friends. It's to be freeing. It's to bring joy to our lives, to bring rest to our lives, to bring hope to our lives. But it was the rules of men that made it harsh, right? But they brought them in, and they allowed them to continue worshiping on Sunday, and eventually that day was transitioned over. In the Catholic world, March 1994, it mentions this, the sun was a foremost god with heathendom. There is, in truth, something royal, kingly about the sun, making it a fit emblem of Jesus, the son of righteousness. And thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Boulder, became the Christian Sunday sacred to who? Sacred to Jesus. Not because of the scripture, but because of the worshiping of the sun. And so here is another uh, sample of an of a ancient pagan hieroglyphic, or whatever you want to call it, picture graph of a piece of a temple. And here are some of the Egyptians, I believe they are, worshiping the sun and receiving its rays. Then you find, here's another sample of the sun disk being honored and reverenced by both the king and the people. And uh, there it is right there. But look there, this is the Vatican Square. This is where the Roman Catholic Church is. This is the center court and the Roman Church in Rome. And if you look at there, you see the sun disk? What is it there? It, the, the, cent, the courtyard of the Roman Church is nothing but a giant what? Sun disk, giving honor and reverence to the sun. Very interesting. Here is a picture of, um, it's a, those are little bitty pieces that were glued together a picture of two monks giving reverence and homage to the sun. Isn't that very interesting? Uh, here's a picture of a crucifix with Jesus uh, on there in a, in a Roman church. And what is the center behind Jesus? It's the worship of the sun. Very, very interesting. Here's Pope John Paul II holding his staff, and it is, has the center of the sun disk. All you have to do is go home and type this in, and you'll find these things on the Internet. So have, let me ask you this, have pagan practices, the worship of the sun, the worship of false idols, the worship of paganistic rituals and practices, have those crept into the church, yes or no? They have crept into the church, friends, and, and it goes much more than the sun disk, but it talks about what, what we see, that is a, it is transitioned not just the, to the sun disk, but also to the sun day at which we are giving homage to the sun when we are keeping that day. Question number four, what other prophetic passage in the book of Revelation reveals the coming together of these two powers to force false worship in the world? Well, if you go with me to Revelation chapter 17, you're going to find, we're going to find that passage as well. Revelation chapter 17, <clears throat> and I want to encourage you to turn there because we're going to be pulling a lot from that chapter, so you can just have your Bibles open and have it right there. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1. Are you guys awake tonight? Okay, good. You're with me. All right, making sure. That's, that was a strong amen, so good. All right, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, 
and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And so Revelation chapter 17 talks about a woman that is actually riding or sitting upon a what? A beast. Are you with me with that? Does that make sense? You, did you hear that? So I'm going to come back to that, but I want you to keep that in mind. But the question we want to ask is, number five, what does a woman represent in prophecy? Because that becomes very important in understanding what this power is, okay? And how do the two women in chapters 12 and 17 of Revelation compare? Well, I think I, I, I actually wrote all these in your study guide, so don't stress about writing them down. But uh, don't, don't stress yourself about it. But in Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to look at two of these, this one and this one. You can look up the rest on your own. Re Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved who? The church. So it, care, it describes the church as what? As the wife of Jesus. And gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with a washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And so the Bible tells us that here the church is symbolized as a what? As a woman, and particularly the bride of who? The bride of Christ. Does everybody, does everybody follow that, yes or no? Here's your other verse, Revelation 21, 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's what? Wife. And so a woman in prophecy, or a woman in Scripture, prophetically, would symbolize very simply what? A church. Now, actually, you find that there are two women in the book of Revelation. There are two women described. There's a woman in Revelation chapter 12 who is pure. She's dressed in white. She has a garland of stars upon her head. And she is precious to the Lord. In fact, the Bible says he protects her from the attack of the serpent who tries to destroy her, the red dragon. Read about, all about that in chapter 12. We're going to cover that on Monday night. So there's this white woman in white who's dressed in white, white being a a symbol of purity in the Bible. And that symbolizes, as we'll actually find out Monday, it symbolizes God's true church throughout time, from the creation until the second coming of Jesus. Okay? Now that is actually, that woman is one of two. The other woman, which greatly contrasts this woman, is found in chapter 17, and the Bible calls her a what? You almost hesitate to say the word, don't you? Harlot. <sighs> right? And so there's this harlot. And so a harlot is a woman who is faithful or unfaithful to her husband. Unfaithful. And an adulterer, now, now I'm not getting too technical on this, but I'm just kind of making a sort of a side point here. An adulterous woman would be one who's unfaithful once or a few times, right? A harlot is one who would be unfaithful how many times? Many times, right? Does that make sense? A harlot is a strong word, isn't it? The woman is also dressed in red. She, uh, she's, got, she's dressed in scarlet. This is kind of, it lo almost looks blue or purple, but it, I'm a little colorblind, but it, it is scarlet. And so she's dressed in scarlet, and usually a woman in red for her wedding dress, I'm not going to say that in case any of you were, but usually it's not always symbolizes a great thing, right? Usually you want to have the white dress, right? But anyway, this would symbolize the false church through time, all the way through time. Does that make sense, yes or no? So you have these two opposing women, one dressed in white, one dressed in red, and we need to be a part of, or we will be a part of one or the other. Make sense tonight? All right. Now, let's take a look. How will this be repeated again? This amalgamation between this woman or, and the beast power, how will that be repeated in the last days? Re Revelation chapter 17. I read verse 1 and 2, so I'm going to read verse 3 through 6. It says, So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, 
And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her head a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, or the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. And then it says in verse 7, But the angel said to me, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. And so he goes on to describe. And so do you think tonight that God wants us to know the identity of this power? What do you suppose? We know it has to be a church because it is a woman, right? And so the woman of Revelation 17 represents the great false church on the earth in the last days. The wine cup in her hand represents all of her false teachings. Now, how do I know that? <clears throat> I'll talk about that in a minute. So, I'm going to tell you up front who this woman is because it's hard to go through the points without you knowing who it is. If you take a guess, you probably know who it is. Who is it, friends? It's also the Roman church. Martin Luther know, knew this. He preached it. John Calvin. All the reformers knew it. They preached it. It is none other, once again, than the Roman Catholic Church. Again, not an attack. But friends, why is it an attack when the Bible clearly points to who it is? And I'm just telling you about it. It's not an attack. I'm just revealing truth to you. Amen? That's all I'm doing. Jesus wants us to all to know truth. You didn't come to the seminar by chance. Jesus brought you here because he wants you to know what is right and true because he loves you and he knows that you're open to it. Amen? All right, so let's go through the identifying characteristics of this woman and confirm that it is indeed the Church of Rome. Number six, what are those identifying characteristics in Revelation chapter 17? We're going to go through them one by one. Number one, this church would be located in a very populated area of Rome or Europe. How do we know that? Because the Bible says in verse 1 that the woman sits on many what? On many waters. And once again, what does waters symbolize? Same chapter, verse 15. The angel tells John, the waters which you saw are what? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So this power sits in a very populated area. Is that area of Europe populated, yes or no? Very populated, right? So it does meet point number one. Number two, it commits fornication with the kings or rulers of the earth. And so fornication is naturally lying with a person who's not your spouse, correct? It's kind of like adultery, right? And so it commits fornication with the kings or the rulers of the earth. The Bible says, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Now, we've seen these pictures before, we know, um, and there are many others that I could show you that I have showed you, but have the kings of the earth been influenced by this power, yes or no? Historically, friends, in the Dark Ages, the governments of the world did whatever this power said to do. Whenever they spoke, she, whenever she spoke, they moved. And, uh, and the, the, the Pope in those days had such power that the kings basically obeyed the Pope. That's how powerful it was. And let me tell you, friends, the power is being regained, and she is quickly ascending to that level of power once again, as history says. When we forget about history, history is deemed to what? Repeat itself. And people today are forgetting history. Number three, the church was arrayed with purple and scarlet. Verse 4, this woman arrayed with purple and scarlet. And I hope you're ready for this. So the point is, is that the woman's, the church's colors would be what? Purple and scarlet. I mean, that's pretty straightforward, right? Well, let's see what we can find. Here is a meeting of the cardinals, multiple cardinals from all over the world together. And what two colors do you see? Purple and scarlet. There is another one there, meeting of the cardinals, purple and scarlet. Another purple and scarlet. 
There's Pope Benedict, purple and scarlet. And by the way, gold, right? You notice gold? Uh, it says that she would be adorned with gold and precious pearls. Here's Pope Benedict again, purple, scarlet. Pope Francis, purple and scarlet. Uh, purple, scarlet. And, but I have a question for you. You find the colors purple, scarlet, white, and gold. In the Bible, do you know what the color scarlet was, is always a symbol of? <clears throat> it's always a symbol of blood, right? Of, of blood being shed. Jesus' blood was shed. What is purple a color of? Of royalty, right? Royalty. Always the gowns of kings were purple because it was a symbol of royalty. How about white? Purity or righteousness, right? Right. If you're wearing, dressed in white, declaring, that's why brides will often wear a, a white robe, I'm sorry, a white dress, wedding dress, because it's a symbol of, of purity, right? And then um, gold is always a symbol of wealth and status, correct? But it's very interesting, friends, that they would wear all these biblical colors to kind of exalt their standing, Yet there is one color that's very common in the Bible that's actually not theirs. Anybody know what color that is? Blue. And do you know what the color blue always was a symbol of in Scripture? The law of God. The law of God. And you can find that in numerous passages. And so that color is missing. Why? Because this power believes that it declares its own what? Its own law. Very, very simple. Number four, it would be a very wealthy church. How do we know that? It says it was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. So it would be very wealthy. And did you know, friends, that the Church of Rome is one of the, is probably, is, actually is the most wealthy institution in the world. No one actually knows how much money they have. But they have probably more money, I don't know, because no one knows, but my guess would be they probably have more money than about all the nations in the world. And it is a fact that they own more land, more property than any nation in the world. They own more property. And so they have property in every, almost every country all around the world and lots of it. It's one of the wealthiest institutions in the world. Number five says it would sit on seven mountains. Verse nine says this calls for a mind with wisdom the seven heads are seven what? Hills on which the woman sits. So the Bible describes these seven heads. Then the angel tells John, those seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. So the fallen church of Revelation 17 has purple and scarlet colors, and she sits on a city with seven hills. Did you know, friends, tonight that geographically surrounding the city of Rome, are actually seven physical hills that surround the city of Rome. It's very, very interesting. There's the Aventine. I'm not going to read them all, but you see them there. You look this up on any kind of encyclopedia or whatever, and these seven hills actually surround the city of Rome. Now, God tries to make it really easy for us, doesn't he? He wants to make it simple. He wants to make it plain. It's not very hard to figure this thing out, we just have to use a little bit of thinking, and the Spirit of God will reveal it to us. Number six, he would be drunk with the blood of the saints. Verse six says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And we find that in the Dark Ages, about 50 million people, depending upon the historian, mentioned that 50 million people were killed during the Dark Ages, and their only crime was that they wanted to follow the Bible, and the Bible only, as their rule of faith. And because the following the Bible and the Bible only went against the, the, the dictates and the mandates and the traditions and dogmas of the church, those people were persecuted, many of them put to the stake. Some of them included the Waldensians and uh, the Huguenots and many different groups. We'll actually talk about some of those in a future meeting. And so these people were put to death for their faith and indeed, the Church of Rome has shed a great amount of innocent blood in its history. And um, there's an attempt to cover that up today, but it's still there. Number seven, it would commit blasphemy. Verse three said, it sat on a 
scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. This is nothing new. We've seen this before. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God and the vicar of God. From Ferris's Ecclesiastical Dictionary. This is a Roman Catholic publication. So it does, according to the Bible, friends, there's two definitions of blasphemy. One, when a man claims to be God, and the other, when a man claims to have the power to do what? To forgive sins. And this power claims both, and therefore commits blasphemy. Number eight, the people of the earth are deceived by her doctrines. And it says, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, <clears throat> let me point out something here. I want to make sure everybody understands this. In Matthew chapter 26, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus makes a very important point. Matthew chapter 26, and you can turn your Bibles there if you'd like, and it says, verse 27, this is the setting here is at the Last Supper. Jesus is with his disciples. He's blessing them before he's going to the cross to be crucified for their and our sins. And he's giving them his final blessing through that communion service, the Last Supper. And he breaks the bread and he gives it to them and they eat. And then in verse 27, it says, Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new what? The new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Aren't you thankful for that cup tonight? Amen? And so Jesus gives that cup, not of fermented juice, but of what kind of juice? Grape juice, pure juice, because he said this cup symbolizes my what? my blood, and it symbolizes the new covenant, or in other words, the teachings of truth. Amen? The new covenant is the teaching of salvation through Christ and faith alone, which was really um, in the Old Testament too, but Jesus is revealing it here. And so that cup with pure wine would be a symbol of the pure teachings of Christ's new covenant. Does that make sense, yes or no? Are you with me? Now, this woman the Bible says, she has a golden cup, and in it is wine, which Jesus had pure wine in his cup, but this wine is alcoholic, naturally, because it makes the people of the earth what? Drunk. And then it says, it's the inhabitants were made drunk with the wine of her what? Fornication. In other words, her unfaithfulness. So as Jesus gave the cup of pure wine to his disciples as a symbol of his blood and pure teaching that would set them free from their sins, so this woman has a cup filled with false wine that would make the earth drunk, which would be a, naturally a symbol of her what? What kind of teachings? False teachings. Does that make sense tonight? Yes or no? Okay. Now, what is... Or what are, what is, I'm trying to get my grammar right here, what is the wine of false teachings that this woman presents to the church? Are you with me tonight? Well, there's several. What is Babylon's wine, this harlot? One is that the Bible is not the supreme authority. We've talked about that, haven't we? That the Pope is the supreme authority. Does, the, does, the, does, does Babylon, does this Roman church teach that the Bible is not the authority as or no? They teach that, don't they? <clears throat> Secondly, that salvation is mixed with the works of men. The church believes that you must mix works with the merit of Christ in order to receive salvation. Is that a true, is that a biblical or false teaching? Yes or no? False. We are saved by what? Grace alone through faith, right? And so that would be another false teaching or drop of wine in that cup. Three, that we confess sins to a priest rather than who? Rather than Jesus. The Bible says that only one mediator between God and man, the man who? 
Jesus Christ, and Jesus is our high priest. You don't need an earthly priest when you have a heavenly priest. Amen? For purgatory, that, that place where we're kind of here, neither here nor there, but we need to be rescued. Once again, we need to be set free into heaven by good works or money, right? We talked about that. Number five, infant baptism. The Bible says that infants, uh, there, there's no example of infant baptism anywhere in Scripture. Not one. Jesus in himself was not baptized until he was 30. I'm not saying you have to be 30, but you have to, baptism is a choice, as a result of a choice to follow Jesus. Amen? Image worship. And so we know about that. We've talked about that. Number seven, praying to dead saints when the Bible says that they are not alive, but they are what? They are dead. Number eight, eternally burning hell, which was used as a kind of a, a scheme to get people to buy indulgences and to pay money for purgatory in the dark ages. Number eight, the secret rapture, which was actually invented by the Roman church to counter the re revelation from the reformers that they were the Antichrist power. And number 10, the Ten Commandments don't matter anymore. And number 11, Sunday worship. All of those things are contrary to Bible truth and would be constituted, friends, as wine in the cup that the woman holds. Now let me assure you tonight, it's not comfortable for me to stand up here and say this. It's not pleasurable for me to say it. But it is the truth, and Christ wants you to know the truth, yes or no? Because it's the truth, dear friends, that sets us free. I don't stand up here because I get paid. I don't stand up here because I want you to join my church. I stand up here because I love you, and Jesus loves you more, and he wants you to believe and know and follow the truth. I almost died. I could be making a lot more money doing something else. In fact, if I wasn't in the ministry, I always told myself I'd want to be a doctor or a farmer, or both. I could make a lot more money being a doctor, and I think, I'd, I think I'd have good bedside manners. I don't know. But I'm here because God's called me to be here. And you're here because God has drawn you here. And friends, these are not things that I say just because I have pleasure saying them, but because they're true. Because Jesus loves you and you need to know them. And more importantly than knowing them, you need to follow them. You need to follow them. So regarding that last point, Sunday worship, Protestants accept Sunday rather than the Saturday as the day for public worship after the Catholic Church made the change. But the Protestant mind does not seem to realize that in observing Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesperson for the church the Pope. I know I've read it before, but just to reemphasize that point, Catholic record, the church is about the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance to Sunday is proof of that fact. In fact, people say, Pastor West, why do, you, why do you keep hammering the Sabbath? Why do you keep talking about the Sabbath? Because that's the commandment that's been changed by this power. If, if they had changed the one that says, Thou shalt not kill, that'd be the one I'm talking about. But all those are still there. This is the one that is the, it, 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 it's, it, it's the one that is important to God because he says, remember it, but we've forgotten it. And we're going to find, friends, it's going to be a test in the last days. Not just the Sabbath itself, but the issue of the authority of the Word of God in our lives. Look at this. This comes from a book called Rome's Challenge. Why do Protestants keep Sunday? This is a written by a Roman Catholic church and it's a Roman Catholic publication, notice what they say. <clears throat> there is only one refuge left for the Protestants. That is to take their stand squarely and fully upon the written word only, the Bible and the Bible alone, and thus upon the Sabbath of the Lord. This is not me, this is the church saying this. Thus acknowledging no authority but God's, wearing no sign but His, speaking about the Sabbath and Ezekiel being a sign to us, 
obeying his command and shielded by his power, they shall have the victory over Rome and all her alliances and stand upon the sea of gas, bearing the harps of God, with which their triumph shall be forever celebrated. So here's this power saying there's only one refuge for the Protestant Christian. The person, the Christian claiming that the Bible can be the only rule of faith must keep the Sabbath. If we, if we claim as a Christian that we stand on the Bible and we don't keep the Sabbath, but we continue in Sunday worship, essentially, friends, what we're saying is, I don't believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. I don't accept that. I accept Rome's claim that they have the power to change God's word and his law, thus changing his character. That's what they're saying. And, it, and, and let me say, friends, it's true. I would back that argument that they make. It is not, is it not yet, it is not yet too late for Protestants to redeem themselves. Will they do it? Will they stand consistently upon the Protestant profession? Or will they still continue to occupy the indefensible, self-contradictory position of professing to be Protestants, yet standing on Catholic ground? Will they indeed take the written word only, the scripture alone, as their sole authority and their sole standard? Or will they hold the practice of following the authority of the Catholic Church and of wearing the sign of her authority, which is Sunday? Will they keep the Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day, according to Scripture? Or will they keep the Sunday according to the tradition of the Catholic Church? So, friends, what, they, what they're pointing out is something very important. That it's bigger than a day, the right day versus the wrong day. The, the, the real issue is, where is the authority of the Word of God in our lives? Where's the authority of the Bible? Is it going to be supreme for us? Or are we going to yield ourselves to the traditions of men? And here's what they end with, the statement. Dear reader, which will you do? Which will you do? Jesus says, remember the Sabbath day. Thank you. Just to keep it holy. It's the seventh day is the Sabbath, the Lord your God. And Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Revelation 14 says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. Friends, tonight, how many of you would follow Jesus? Follow Jesus, friends. Number seven, what is the biblical identifying point that the Church of Rome is not the only entity involved in this last day system of religious confusion called Babylon? This is where it gets really hard for me to speak to you tonight. This is a truth I'm telling you up front. It's going to cut. It's going to cut deep. But if you open your heart to Jesus, you'll see the truth in it, okay? Can, you, can we do that? How many of you would open your heart to Jesus tonight? Whatever he shows you. The ninth point in verse 5 says that the mother church would have daughters. Daughters. Verse 5 says, And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great. And notice this, the what? Mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now when a woman has a daughter, the daughter reflects the character of the what? Of the mother. Okay? And if the mother harlot is a church, the church of Rome, then if she is the mother of daughters who reflect her, then that would simply symbolize that there are other churches who are broken from Rome who would be reflecting the same characteristics as who? As the mother. From Reverend John O'Brien, The Faith of Millions. But since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible, he's talking, when he says non-Catholics, he's talking about Protestants and evangelicals, who take, profess to take their religion directly from the Bible, not from the church, observe Sunday instead of Saturday. Yes, of course, it is inconsistent, but the change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. They have continued to observe custom 
even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. Now notice this, friends. The observance remain, that observance remains the reminder of the what? The Mother Church, this is a Roman Catholic publication, the Mother Church <clears throat> from which non-Catholic sects broke away like a boy running away from his mother but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Now think about this. This is essentially what he's saying by that. He's saying that these churches who continue in that tradition make the claim that they've broken away from Rome, but they still continue in her false teachings. Are you with me? And it's like a little boy that says, Mommy, I don't like you anymore. I'm running away. And he runs away and he gets out of the house and he gets out into the woods and then he looks back and he pulls out a picture of his mom and he says, Oh, Mother, I'm still, my heart's still with you. Right? He's saying, My heart is still with you. And churches who continue in non biblical teachings that Rome has instituted, who claim to have broken away, essentially have not really broken away. They are what? Daughters of the mother. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Who is Babylon? It's very simply. Babylon is much more than the church of Rome. The church of Rome is the woman, but there is a system called Babylon. Do you know what Babylon means, friends? It means religious confusion. Confusion is what the word Babylon means. It come, that's where we get the word babble, a baby babbles. And so who is Babylon? It's not just Rome, but any church that teaches any of the mother church's doctrines is considered what? Babylon, a daughter of Babylon, a daughter of Babylon. Those list of 11 things, the rapture, the state of the dead, infant baptism, and Sunday worship, and, and many other things. Any church that teaches those things and practices them would be considered a daughter of the mother. Are you with me tonight? I told you it would cut and I told you it would hurt. But again, it's truth. And I have to tell you. Because I can't stand guilty before God for not telling you. And I tell you because I love you and because Jesus loves you. The Bible says that the church and state will unite in the future to press these false teachings upon the world through the laws and actions, and they will go against the, con the direct law of God. Here's a book, Bible commentary by Fawcett and Brown. State and church are precious gifts from God, but the state being desecrated becomes beast-like, and the church apostatizing becomes the harlot. And so the Bible tells us that the woman will ride the what, friends? Will ride the beast. Now, how many of you have ever ridden a horse before? If you ride a horse, who's in control? Well, hopefully you, right? <laughs> Sometimes a horse gets in control and then you're usually off, right? But if it, if it all goes well, you're in control because you're riding it and you have the what in your hand? The reins and you're telling that horse where to go. Prophetically, the Bible says that the woman rides the beast. The church, as in the dark ages, will once again in the last days control the state and she will ride the beast, and she will tell it where to go and what to do. And in the Dark Ages, the Mother Church told the, the governments of Europe what to do, but guess what she will do in the last days? She will tell the governments of the world what to do, and who's the vehicle or the nation that she does it through? The United States of America, the superpower of the world. Once again, History is going to be repeated. And the second beast will tell those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast 
who was wounded by the sword and lived. What is the image? It is the image of false worship through any of the wine teachings of Babylon. And the Bible says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand of their foreheads, and no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. And it's already, friends, coming together. Can you see it? Look at this, friends. For the first time, once again, I mentioned it, but for the first time, the Pope stands before the United States Congress joint session and gives a speech to which every person in the room stands and cheers and applauds. I don't know that that's even ever happened before. They're coming together and the plans are being laid, the mother church and the power. In 2014, there was a gentleman named uh, Tony Palmer. How many of you ever heard of Tony Palmer? He was a, he's an, he's an uh, Anglican archbishop who works for the Church of Rome. He actually died that summer. But he, his sole purpose was to make the bridge between Protestantism and Evangelicalism and Roman Catholicism to try to bring them together. He stood in a speech in Texas in front of 10,000 Protestant pastors and evangelical pastors. And he said the statements I'm about to show to you. And when he said those statements, the place went wild. They went crazy. They loved it. They were clapping and cheering. These are the things that he said. <clears throat> he gave a, he, Pope Francis gave a speech to the Protestants in which Joseph, he talks about Joseph going down to Egypt, okay? And then Tony talks about this. It says, when Joseph's brothers went to Egypt to find bread, what they really found was their brother, okay? So notice this. Egypt in the Bible is always a symbol of sin or things that are not right, okay? Not right biblically. And so Joseph's brothers went to find bread. What is bread a symbol of in the Scripture? It's a symbol of the Scripture, right? Now bear with me. He says, Pope Francis says... What Pope Francis says awakens us to the fact that the real communion is not the what? The bread, which is the word, but our what? Our brother. What brother is he talking about? He's talking about, as a Roman Catholic pope, he's talking about the long-lost brother of Protestantism and those who have broken away from the church. And he says the bread is secondary to finding our brother. In other words, the word is secondary to unity. And then he says, Luther's protest is over, is yours. Talking about the Protestant Reformation. He said that to ministers, and they all clapped and cheered. Then he says Pope Francis is calling for full unity of all Christians. He says we are a new generation. Let's take a new stand. We need not continue in the sins of our fathers. And he was talking about Protestantism, calling it a sin. Then he says, Protestantism is out of sync with reality. We must wake up and unite. Go home tonight and Google Tony Palmer, speech to, uh, to, to ministers, and, and it'll pull up. How can we continue to live as Protestants in a post-Protestant world? I challenge all leaders to stand up and say the protest is now over. Let's unite, right? And what, a couple more here. Pope Francis gives, calls us to put an end to the separation between Catholic Christians and other Christians. I am challenging all non-Roman Catholics to stop continuing in the sin of separation. Is that the same thing? No. The sin of separation that has perpetuated the history of the church. So he's putting the blame of the past not upon the Roman church, but upon the Protestant church. Now, friends, I, I want to say this so that you know I'm not biased. I would be happy today to unite with Pope Francis if he would deny the fact that the papacy has power over Scripture. If he would put the Scripture as the sole authority for the Christian, I'd unite with him today on every issue. Amen? So I'm not against the Pope, but I'm against those that deviate from Scripture. Then he says... Protestantism is spiritual racism. 
And he says, I challenge all religious leaders to sign a document declaring the end of the Reformation. He said this to 10,000 Protestant and evangelical Christian ministers to the cheering applause of all. Do you think today, friends, that that bridge is being built? It's already built, friends. The final prophecies are being fulfilled very rapidly, right before our very eyes. Now is the time to open our hearts to full to Christ, follow his word, and prepare for his soon return. Question number eight, I think it's our last one. What counsel does Jesus give when we find ourselves in the system of Babylon, whether in the mother church or in one of the daughter churches? If we find ourselves in the mother church or in one of the daughters, which is any church that teaches any of her teachings, including Sunday worship, what does Jesus, what does God say from heaven in Revelation chapter 18? It says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, what, friends? Come out of her. And notice what he says, my people. Those of you today who are in this system, but you see the truth. Jesus says what, friends? Come out. Come out from among her. That you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Come out, Jesus says. With all of his heart, he says, come out. And if we come out, we have to go in somewhere. When Jesus lovingly calls his people out of Babylon, where does he tell them to go? He says, go in to those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Whatever church that is on earth, Jesus says, that's where you go. You come out and you go in. And I want you to notice this verse, friends. We, we, pe people... People trump on this point, and it's true, but there's a, there's a second half to that truth. People say, well, Jesus has his people in every church, and how many of you believe that's true tonight? It's true. In all the churches, all the system of Babylon, in every church, Jesus says, I have my people. But he says to his people who are there, come out. And notice this verse, this is the one that many people point to. He says, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. So Jesus has his people in every church, right? But notice what he says. And them also I must what? I must bring. And they will hear my voice, and there will be what? One flock and one shepherd. There is one flock, and that flock is the flock that follows the truth of the Word of God tonight. And Jesus calls us out of that false system and into that one flock where He is the true shepherd. Does that mean that all those people aren't Christians in, in, in those churches? Is that what that means? That means they're all lost and going to hell? No. But it means that Jesus is calling them out. And he's calling you out. It doesn't mean that the people are necessarily rotten. Some of them are. Rotten people in every church. Right? But it means that there's a truth that Jesus calls us to follow in the last days. And he's saying, come and follow that truth. Tonight, friends, Jesus calls us lovingly, kindly, compassionately but directly and firmly come out and into my truth the truth of my word tonight friends how many of you want to say Jesus I want to follow you I want to follow you and tonight, there might be somebody to here this evening who finds themselves in that system of Babylon. 
And you love the people there. You love the pastor there. Good people. But you see that maybe they're confused. Maybe they're, they don't understand the truths that you've learned. And tonight you hear the voice of Jesus saying, come out. <clears throat> come in to the flock of truth where there's one shepherd, there's one fold, and that fold just follows the Bible. And you say, Lord Jesus, I want to follow your call tonight. I want to follow your voice tonight. I want to follow the Spirit of God, which leads to the truth of the Word of God, which comes from the heart of Jesus. And Lord Jesus, tonight, if you say, come out, by your grace and by your love and power, I'll come out. If that's you tonight, dear friend, would you just raise your hand wherever you are? This is not a general appeal, but just a specific appeal. It says, Lord Jesus, I'm going to follow you and I'm coming out. Is that your desire tonight? Is there any that would raise their hand this evening? Praise the Lord. I see a couple of hands tonight. Jesus says he invites you to come out. God bless you, sister. Any others that would say, Lord Jesus, I make that decision. I'm coming. I'm coming to you, Lord. I'm coming to you. Amen. Let's bow our heads together as we pray. Father, tonight, we praise your name, O Lord, for you have revealed to us truth. And Lord, once again, it might, it, it was challenging, it was tough, it was cutting. But Lord, it's truth. And, and Lord, you love us. You're calling us, you're drawing us in these last days to the deep truths of the scripture, to the words of truth, the words of life. And Lord, as we uncover truth, we're really uncovering your heart as you reveal it to us through scripture. And Lord, we pray tonight that our hearts would be one with yours, and that our desire would be to follow you with all of our hearts. And Lord, that we would come out of that system that may not be representing your truth in the last days. And Lord, it's not a condemnation, it's not a criticism, it's not judgment. It's just simply revealing what your word has written. And so Lord, we pray tonight that your spirit would speak to us, would continue to wrestle with us, and reveal to us what is true, what is right, and what your will is. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say, amen. Don't forget, friends, tomorrow morning at 11, Mark of the Beast. Tomorrow night, Revelations 4 Horsemen. Have a wonderful evening.